Good morning. Good morning to you. Good morning to you, one and all. My name's John. I'm one of the assistant pastors here. I want to welcome you to City Reform. It's great to be among you this morning. It's great that it hasn't rained yet today. Maybe some of this water will dissipate and dry out, and uh, it's going to make for a beautiful, lovely spring. God has gifts in store for us from His creation uh, sprouting up as we speak. Um, Our call to worship is a really special call to worship today. When we think about these words in Psalm 28, and as we call one another into worship, there's an invitation an invitation to trust in the Lord. Maybe you've trusted in the Lord before and maybe you've not. But either way, as we call one of them to worship, I want you to consider to trust Jesus and to trust Him more. To trust our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and to trust Him more. To trust Him because He is the saving refuge of His anointed. He saves us. He is our refuge to trust him because he is our shepherd and he carries us. We can trust him, people. We can trust our covenant God to do everything that he said he's going to do. And when we really let that sink deep down into our bones, It puts the cares and the troubles of this life, which are real and difficult, but nonetheless, it puts them in perspective, that our covenant God can be trusted. So let's think about that and uh, meditate on that as we call one another into worship using the words printed on page one of your bulletin. I'll invite you to stand if you're able. I'll read the part of the leader if you could respond with the part of the people. Blessed be the Lord. For he has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am held. My heart exalts and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Let us pray. Our gracious God in heaven, we come to you now, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, you are above us. You are greater than us. You are incomprehensible to us. And yet you have revealed yourself. Yet you come near to us. Yet you speak to us. Yet you desire relationship with us. And so we come now. Uh, We come now to know you and to know you more, and we come to trust you and to trust you more. So would you be at work in our midst now, showing us all the ways in which you're worthy, uh, not just of our uh, praise and worship, but of the trust of our very hearts. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing.
Now the word of the Lord from Isaiah 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord 
we have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. What is our time where we confess our sins and we confess our sins because we're in need of God's grace and we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness so let's hear our call to confession I'll have a couple words about it um, that you may or may not appreciate and then we'll move on to confessing our sins together <clears throat> first John chapter 4 verses 20 through 21 if anyone says I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen 
cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now, uh, you students of the New Testament often know that when the New Testament says brothers, you'll see a little footnote, and it'll say brothers and sisters. And here's the part you, you may not like. So you're saying this, this isn't just talking about a brother, this is talking about brothers and sisters? Well, no, I'm, I'm, that's actually not what I'm saying. And, and you're saying it's not just talking about physical brothers and sisters, but brothers and sisters in Christ? No, that's not what I'm saying either. I'm saying we need to read this more as neighbor, right? This is, I think, I'm going to suggest, speaking even more broadly than that, that those of us who don't deserve God's mercy and grace, and while we were his enemies, yet he died for us, the love that God pours into us should so fill our hearts that we can't hold hatred for anyone. And yet we do. And so we come now to confess the ways in which we have not loved, yes, our physical brothers, and yes, our physical sisters, and yes, our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, but maybe even beyond that, the hatred that still is in our hearts uh, towards others. We confess that uh, together. So let's pray our prayer of confession, and uh, then we'll take a few moments to make this personal, and then we'll hear uh, this assurance of pardon. So let's pray now together. Father... You love your people as we are, but you also are working to change us. You have promised that your eternal purposes include forming us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. We confess that instead of seeking to grow up into maturity, we are too often content to remain the same. Change seems scary, and we value comfort and security too much. Help us to see the glory of the cross and the beauty of our upward call in Christ Jesus. Help us to know Jesus better and become more like him. We pray that your love would fill our hearts and lead us to truly love our brothers and sisters. Do this so that Jesus will be glorified in our lives. Amen. Let's pray silently. all those whose hope and trust is in Christ alone for salvation. Hear now this assurance of pardon. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also we are in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. I'm going to invite Pastor Matt up here to lead us in a baptism. All right, we'll invite.
invite the Martin family to come forward. Eric and Becky with Penelope Rose. We're excited to have them, and I think Olivia's going to join them as well. Oh, she's just taking pictures. Okay. Aunt, that's a, a special aunt duty, important stuff. All right. Um, the Bible says children are a blessing from the Lord. It's important for us to remember that. In my experience, they bless us in at least two broad categories of ways. Uh, They can bless us with the joy and the happiness and uh, the fulfillment that they bring into our lives. And sometimes they bless us uh, by, by being difficult and showing us how much we need God's help. Uh, and sometimes they do both of them at the same time, all mingled together, right? And uh, I think uh, most people who have some parenting experience uh, would be able to say, sometimes my kids are used by God to reveal how much I need God, right? That's a great sanctifying work. And this is one of the great things I provided for my parents when I, when I was growing up. Uh, <laughs> And uh, their prayers uh, for, for justice have sometimes been answered in my own uh, parenting. Uh, and so um, we are so thankful to come here today. Um, and uh, in, this, uh, in this sacrament, uh, we are not only confessing our need to God, but we're also recognizing as a congregation that this is something we do together. Um, for me, when I, as a parent, when my kids were baptized and uh, whoever was doing the baptism would read that vow to the congregation that you're gonna hear, hear me read uh, today. It's saying, do you promise to support this family as they raise the kid? That was always the moment where I felt I just breathe a sigh of relief. I'm like, okay, thank you. (laughs) Because we're not in this alone. But even even more importantly, uh, we're we're gonna read this. This whole thing is couched in the promises of God. We're gonna ask you, do you commit and dedicate Penny to God? And you talk about what you're gonna do, but the, the heart of this sacrament is what God promises to do. He's bigger than than all of our weaknesses, and he helps us in so many ways. So uh, there's a great encouragement in this. In this this baptism, God is the central character of the whole thing. As cute as Penny is, and as as happy as we are all to be here today, uh, God is the central actor. These are the things he promised that we remind ourselves of. Acts chapter 16. Uh, I'm sorry, beginning in Acts chapter 2. For to you is the promise, and your children, and all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call unto him. And from Genesis 17, the Lord speaking again. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your children after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto you and your children after you. And from Acts chapter 16, believe in the Lord and you will be saved, you and your household. We, uh, in uh, baptizing Penny, we're not saying we know she has saving faith, but we know that God is our covenant God. We pray that he would work through your role as parents, through our church, to bring her to a place of trusting Jesus. And we look forward to that day where she could own her baptism vows herself and confirm uh, her membership in the church. Until then, we welcome her visibly into the congregation And we recite these promises, putting the sign and seal of the covenant on her head, looking for God to work and trusting in him as the great actor in this drama of life. So these are the promises for you, for the parents. Do you acknowledge your child's need for the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do you claim God's covenant promises on her behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation as you do your own? If so, answer, we do. Do you now unreservedly dedicate your child to God and promise and humble reliance upon divine grace 
that you will endeavor to set before her a godly example, that you will pray with and for her, and that you will teach her the doctrines of our holy faith, and that you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring her up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, if so answer we do. And this question is for the congregation, members of City Reform. Do you as a congregation undertake the responsibility of assisting the parents in the Christian nurture of this child? If so, answer, we do. That's good good news. Um, Say hi and just uh, look at you quickly. All right. She's happy to be here today. All right. Penelope Martin, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. John, would you pray for us? Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this family. We thank you for this covenant child. We thank you for the work of Jesus Christ in our lives, and we pray for that same work in your timing in young Penelope. So, Lord, help her parents to raise her in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and uh, help us to come alongside and do all that we can that this child may know you all the days of her life. And, Lord, we trust you with that because you're good and you're worthy to be trusted and worthy to be praised. And so be with this family, and may they bring you great glory as they seek to serve you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. It's always beautiful to see and wonderful to take part in. Uh, We move now to a time of corporate prayer. So we're going to have a couple members of our congregation come up and pray. And I'll close us as we move towards our offering and song of renewal. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your faithfulness to us as a congregation and for the opportunity to worship you this morning. Lord, we pray for the young people in our congregation that you would cause them to know, love, and proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior. We pray for turnover in the staff and transitions in the staff. Would you provide people to fill the vacancies that still exist and provide smooth entry for those coming on board in new or different roles? Lord, you have faithfully provided places for City to meet these last 20 years, and we look to you for provision of a new home for us, a home that will meet our needs and allow us to be a place of refuge and restoration in the Oakland area. And we pray for those in our midst who are sick and suffering, especially the Partridges and the Chos. We ask you to bring healing and comfort to them and others in our congregation who need you in their lives in this way. We pray in Jesus' name. Lord, you are the only light which is able to illuminate the dark places of the world. Lord, I pray that you would show your grace abundantly to the people of Zimbabwe. I pray that you would send rain to replenish needed water sources. I pray that if it be your will, you would change the hearts of people in leadership and bring them wisdom and guide the upcoming election. I also pray specifically for Craig and Mel Jones and their ministry in Zimbabwe. I pray that their church would be able to effectively minister to the poor and oppressed as economic conditions deteriorate. I pray that you would give Craig strength and encouragement in his pastoral ministry and would make it fruitful for the spread of the gospel. Also, Lord, please be with the Jones family with Brett as he pursues his studies in college, and Dean as he decides what school he wants to go to. I pray that you would draw this family together in yourself. All these things I pray in your name. 
Father in heaven, we come to you now, thanking you and praising you for the ways in which uh, you are at work by your spirit in our midst. Uh, Lord, we praise you for Jesus, for who he is and all that he has done for us. Lord, would he be more believable and more beautiful to us this day for having met with you. Uh, Lord, uh, would your spirit be prompting our hearts now as we hear from your word? Uh, would you speak? Uh, would you speak through uh, Dave uh, that we might um, know you more and the power of your resurrection? Uh, Lord, we're trusting you in all things. Uh, Lord, we come uh, broken and bruised. Uh, we come uh, fearful. We come worried about many things. Uh, and Lord, uh, yet you ask us, you invite us uh, to bring all of our cares and burdens to you. And so we do that now. We lay them at your feet uh, because uh, you have promised to go before us. You have gone before your people for thousands of years and you will continue to do so until Christ comes back. Lord, even now we pray that you would hasten that day. Uh, we long for a world in which there are no more tears, no more sickness, no more pain, no more suffering, no more death. Would Christ be our hope in the midst of all of these things? So, Lord, we uh, pray now uh, that you would continue to provide for us, uh, Lord, that uh, you would continue to lay upon the hearts of your people to give with glad and generous spirits. And so we dedicate uh, this offering to you. We ask that you would use it. Uh, for the upbuilding of your kingdom uh, through City Reformed and through the partner ministries we support in this, in this area of the world uh, and throughout your kingdom. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll, we'll take a moment to pause and reflect uh, before we pass around the offering bags and before we sing. You can let us know about things that are on your heart in terms of uh, prayer requests. These get prayed for. Uh, every Wednesday uh, in our prayer meetings. And so take a moment and see if the Lord will lead you to write something down.
things going on in the world, <clears throat> wars and rumors of wars, uh, think of the attack on Israel recently, and Father, uh, the ongoing war in Ukraine, and uh, many other places where suffering is happening. Uh, Father, um, it is easy to be uh, overwhelmed by news of different types, and uh, just this week I was talking to some students talking about how the rising generation uh, is um, often overwhelmed and hopeless. <clears throat> Father, I pray that uh, you would fill us with hope that your people would be like stars shining uh, in this world. And Father, I do pray that uh, the hope of the resurrection, uh, the love of Christ, and the forgiveness of sins would be known uh, and throughout this world and throughout our city. Father, we pray as we turn to your word now that uh, we would have ears to hear what you have for us. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, you would use my words even though uh, I am a sinner. And Father, I pray that you would um, leave uh, in people's uh, minds what they need to hear and that other things would uh, pass away. <clears throat> Father, we just um, pray as we turn to your word now that you would bless the reading of your word. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So good morning, everybody. Uh, we are starting a three-week series. Uh, yeah, there is a children's church, so if uh, you were... A, Someone who participates in that, now is the time to head out for that. Uh, so yeah, we are starting a three-week series leading up to the banquet, uh, which we are having the 20th anniversary banquet uh, on Saturday the 27th. So uh, this week I'll be speaking, <clears throat> Matt will be speaking uh, next week, and then Rob Gray, who some of you remember, will be speaking for the third week because he'll be in town for the banquet. He's a, a previous associate pastor of our church. Uh, and so you could say the series is generally about uh, the vision, the philosophy of City Reformed. And so <clears throat> my uh, task here this morning is to tell you a little bit about the starting vision of uh, what we were thinking of 20 years ago, and actually more than 20 years ago, uh, as we started to um, do some of these things and put together a team to do this. And there's two sides to that. One of them, uh, you've probably been around for any uh, amount of time, you've probably heard us talk about a uh, sort of a, a target area or a target people, and we'll often use the phrase the university and medical communities, uh, or we'll talk about the center of the city uh, and uh, being present here in Oakland. So you can say that is uh, a vision of place, a vision of, of mission. Uh, but there's another aspect that I'm going to focus on this morning, <clears throat> which is, um, you could say, uh, a philosophy of ministry, to use a, a technical word, uh, or you could say our style, a type of church. So we're not just about being in a place, but we're also about being a certain type of church uh, in this place. And so we sometimes will call that a philosophy of ministry, how we do church, how we make daily decisions. Uh, so the passage that we have uh, for this morning to talk about that is printed in your bulletin. It's on page seven. <clears throat> this is in uh, Acts chapter 2. And uh, I, I just included one verse there, uh, verse 36, which is uh, just uh, the tail end of a long sermon by the Apostle Peter. Uh, so he gives a whole exposition. This is uh, just shortly uh, after Jesus died uh, and was raised from the dead. 
And there was this very famous uh, incident uh, in the uh, second chapter of Acts where the Holy Spirit comes in miraculous form. There are uh, all kinds of things going on. And then the people ask uh, Peter to say something and he stands up and he ends with the statement that I'm gonna start out with here. <clears throat> and then we see going on from that what the people's response was. Uh, so let's listen to God's word from Acts chapter two. Uh, again, from the apostle Peter. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. <clears throat> now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and, those, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. <clears throat> and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. So the uh, first question to think about is, is this passage really for us? Is this uh, something that applies to us? There's some things about the context of this passage that make it uh, unique uh, in, in ways that are not really uh, things that we can apply directly to ourselves. It's certainly a unique time for the church. It's the really beginning of the Christian church. There are some things going on that we don't see uh, in the church today, such as apostles writing the Bible, um, uh, the apostles doing miracles, uh, and most of the people there having an immediate memory of having seen Jesus and heard him preach. Uh, it's also, I would say, a unique time of revival. You can see just the, the, uh, the, the breakout of so many people uh, responding in a positive way and coming to Christ. Uh, and we talked in our Sunday school class uh, over the past couple of months about uh, revival uh, and how it's really something that we can't <clears throat> make happen. Uh, we can't uh, cause mass numbers of people to be cut to the heart uh, and to repent of their sins and so on. Uh, that really is the work of the Holy Spirit. So on one level we could say, well, there's some things about this passage that don't apply to us. On the other hand, there's something really sweet going on here. Right? When we look at this, I would say most every Christian, when reading this passage, says, boy, I wish I were there. Right? Wouldn't that be a, a great uh, place to be? Uh, and so is there, is there some aspects of this uh, that we would say really are meant to be characteristic of God's church uh, universally? Uh, so uh, one way of sort of thinking about the vision of City Reformed uh, from the very beginning into this day <clears throat> is to kind of say, we want it. We want it, what's in this passage. Uh, there are some churches that would in de facto, if not explicitly, say, well, we really do one thing well. Uh, we're about this. <clears throat> and we can't really do these other things that are going on. Uh, that's for other churches. And to some degree, when we start out, we say, well, we want it all. Like, we don't, we want, we don't want to say some of this Acts 2 stuff uh, isn't for us. We, we really want to, to have this kind of a culture. And so that's the question before us, is that possible? Is that a pipe dream? Uh, and uh, I guess I would say, as we look at some of this, we'll see some of this that really has been built into city uh, and, um, and some that we could maybe do better at. So I really just have three points to draw out uh, from the passage. <clears throat> In general, if I think about the vision of city reform, there's many, many aspects of it. So I'm just gonna draw out three of them this morning. Uh, that doesn't mean that's all we're about and there's nothing more to say. <clears throat> there's so much more I think I uh, could talk about. <clears throat> but there's really just three uh, main things I want to bring out. So the first I would say 
is uh, our vision was to be a community of knowing each other. That may sound uh, a little bit odd. Uh, don't we generally know each other? Uh, well, not necessarily in the modern world. So if you look at this passage, especially starting there in verse 42, one of the things that really has to jump out at you is that they were together. Uh, and they had, uh, is, I'll just read this again, verse 44. All who believed were together and had all things in common. Uh, and then in verse 46, day by day, they were attending the temple together uh, and they were breaking bread in their homes and they were devoting themselves to the fellowship, uh, it says. So this is something I would say in the modern world needs to be explicit. There was a time in the history of the church when you know, everybody lived uh, pretty much in walking distance of a church, and you actually see in Pittsburgh here, churches with no parking lot whatsoever. That's one of the reasons why it's hard for us to buy a church, <laughs> because everybody lived you know, within a few blocks of the church and walked to church. And so they didn't have to explicitly say, how do we do community? They were a community. They lived right there. They saw each other every day. Uh, but as uh, you were all well aware, we live in a fractured world in which people, uh, their networks of relationships are not necessarily the people living right around them and walking distance. Uh, and so that means that we have to be explicit about targeting and getting to know each other and actually uh, living side by side with each other. We tend are by default to isolate. <clears throat> um, and so if you think about church as primarily an educational activity of sort of you know, learning stuff about the Bible, for example, uh, or as an entertainment activity as hearing some nice music, then there wouldn't be this need to come together. You could just you know, hear it on the internet, get a pod, download a podcast or download some music or whatever. Uh, but uh, looking at this template here, at this culture of the church in Acts 2, I would say that one of the crucial aspects of it is they actually knew each other and saw each other and had uh, relationships with each other. Now, the way this actually in practice worked in the city when we started out uh, was we had lots of parties. Uh, and some of you were around at that time. Uh, and uh, in some sense, you could say we created a party culture of the church. Uh, now, at one level, you could say it's just good strategy for church planning because it's a good way to get to know a lot of people. It's also a very non-threatening way to invite people who might not otherwise go into a church uh, to meet some Christians uh, and to uh, get to know people as well. Uh, but it's not just strategy, uh, I would argue, and some of you have heard me uh, say this many times over the years. Uh, I would say that the Bible actually endorses this as as a Christian culture. Uh, <clears throat> so the phrase I often say is the kingdom of God is like a party to which everyone is invited. If you look at, I'm not gonna read it, but if you look in your additional scriptures, Matthew 22, Jesus basically says exactly that. He says the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about <clears throat> all the people that were invited uh, and the people who were offended that the other people were invited and didn't come. Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but if you even look back in the Old Testament, you look at the law of Moses, there was actually a command to have festivals a certain number of times a year. And at those festivals, there was a lot of eating and drinking. Uh, there was what was called fellowship offerings. Uh, and so people would come into uh, Jerusalem and there would be a massive party. Uh, and then we look at the end of the Bible in Revelation, uh, and we actually sang about that uh, this morning, <clears throat> that the uh, picture of heaven uh, that we get is that of a party, of a wedding feast. Uh, and uh, that is the picture that we have of the kingdom of God. And we see that in this passage here. <clears throat> it says that they were uh, breaking bread together uh, in each other's homes. Now, uh, some people might technically say, well, what is that talking about? Is that talking about parties uh, in people's homes? Or is that talking about the Lord's Supper? Uh, and actually, as I've looked into the issue quite a bit, I would say, yes, actually, it's both. Uh, if you look at the history of the church, it was very common for them to have a, a, basically a potluck supper and conclude the potluck supper uh, with the Lord's Supper uh, <clears throat> that would be uh, led by one of the leaders of the church. Uh, and so it's not an either or. They're doing communion, uh, but they're also talking about just handing out a lot of food. 
right? And so it says, uh, they distributed it to anyone who had need, and they were breaking bread in their homes, receiving their food with glad and generous hearts. That sounds to me like a party, right? Glad and generous hearts. Uh, people uh, having food with glad and generous hearts. <clears throat> um, so uh, this point, uh, this first point of uh, getting to know each other, uh, one of the practical uh, implications of that is actually to keep doing that, to keep having parties. Uh, our dream uh, for this church would be that all of your best friends are in the church with you. Uh, maybe not all of your friends, but that you have a significant number of close friends in the church. That it's not just a place to kind of go, do your duty, uh, and then return home. Uh, but rather that this would be a place where you say, these are my people. Uh, this is my family. This is my people. And in practice, um, how does that happen in our church? Uh, even in a group this size, uh, it's hard to get to know everybody. So what we created from the beginning is what a lot of you know is our community group structure of having groups that meet in people's homes. So I would say this, if you have uh, not been invited to any parties, um, make sure, first of all, that you're a member of a community group because that's where you're going to get to know people. And the community groups are kind of like a party. I don't know about all of them, but a lot of them have pretty good refreshments. Uh, so um, that's actually intentional that we have food at those community groups. So. Uh, you could say it's a sort of a party with a Bible study. Um, but uh, also, we encourage people one-on-one -on -one, uh, to practice hospitality. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of times people may think, well, I'm not really an insider, so I can't be the one throwing the party. I'm waiting around for other people to invite me to their parties. And I would say the culture we're talking about is, no, don't wait. Uh, throw your own party. Invite other people uh, over. Uh, and there doesn't have to be an agenda, there doesn't have to be an occasion. Uh, you can simply have people over. Uh, or if you don't have a home or that's really practical, uh, you can arrange getting together at a restaurant with a bunch of people uh, and be welcoming and, uh, and invite other people. Um, <clears throat> so the mindset that really in is involved in this, I hope you pick up, is really a sense of joy uh, and of freedom. And this is where I think the gospel uh, comes in. Uh, we say in all of our literature, I think it's even in uh, the bulletin, uh, that we call ourselves a gospel-centered church. Uh, and uh, really, one of the things that we would say is that the gospel is meant to give us a sense of freedom and a sense of joy and fellowship. And so I'm going to ask you, sort of as a concluding point for this, a concluding application for this first point, uh, do you see the Christian life primarily as drudgery and following rules? Uh, is that your view of what it means to be a Christian? If so, I would argue you haven't yet really grasped the gospel. Uh, the gospel says that if we know that our sins are forgiven in Christ once and for all, then our hearts and spirits can be free. And it will naturally flow out from a heart like that, that we are gracious and welcoming toward other people. Uh, and so, you know, think about the context of this passage here. It says they receive their food with glad and generous hearts. Why? Well, because Paul, I mean, Peter had just said, uh, you, you killed Christ. But then he goes right on to say, if you repent and, uh, and are baptized, you will be forgiven for your sins and receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so this is a promise to them. And it is a gracious place where they say, we are overjoyed at the fact that we are not cut off and rejected, but rather we are forgiven uh, of our sins. Now, it doesn't mean we do nothing but have parties. Uh, there are uh, times of lament. Uh, there are times when it is appropriate, and we see this in the Bible. There are times when people fast. Uh, there are times when people uh, share their sorrows. But I would argue that actually you lament better when you also are lamenting with people that you know well uh, and that you've had fellowship with. Um, and if you are unknown to those people, you're not going to be able to lament with them when the time comes to lament. Uh, we lament well with people who we also partied well with. Uh, and there's a rhythm to life uh, that we rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who, who, uh, who are weeping. Uh, and so... Uh, this is actually a priority. This is not just sort of like a, a, a side thing of the church. We make it a priority to actually say we're going to have times of fellowship together. Uh, and usually those involve food. 
Uh, and so practical application of this is after church, there'll be bagels. Uh, and uh, you are welcome to join that. Uh, and um, again, it's easy for us if we have a mindset of the Christian life is all about drudgery and rules, then it seems like, well, it's a waste of money to spend money on parties and food like this. But if we say, no, like the kingdom of God in eternity is about doing that, when we have these parties and fellowship times, we're actually putting one foot in the door of heaven. And we're saying that we're actually modeling what the kingdom of God is like. Okay, so that was a long uh, point number one. Uh, point number two uh, I would call a ministry to all. So you notice in verse 44 it says, All who believed were together <clears throat> and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Uh, now, some people have argued that this was the abolition of private property. Uh, I think if you look at the rest of the New Testament, you'll see that people owned land. They had the right to distribute uh, what they wanted uh, out of their own freedom. Uh, but we shouldn't just pass over this too lightly. Uh, it does really point to what I would call a communal identity. It points to a picture in which your problems are my problems. And so uh, it's not as though we come and we all put on a happy face and then everyone else, uh, everyone goes home uh, and is kind of miserable and uh, has to seal, deal with all their problems on their own. Uh, the, the, the nature, the goal we have for city reform is that we be involved in each other's lives, uh, including uh, the problems. And the one thing I want to sort of uh, focus in on this uh, with City uh, is uh, the idea of um, when we talk about ministry, uh, people who are doing ministry and people who are receiving ministry, those are not two separate groups of people. I think it's a, it's a very common mentality that we can have to say, well, there are the ministers who are like the staff or you know, elected leaders or appointed volunteers, whatever, and they kind of have their lives together uh, and, they, you know, and they do the ministry. Uh, and then there's the ministry targets. Uh, and those are the people who have like serious problems uh, and uh, they're being ministered to. Uh, but actually what I would say is that all of us spend some time in both of those categories. Uh, and that we shouldn't view it as well, if I'm gonna do ministry, I can't let anybody know that I have any problems. Uh, and on the other hand, if I have a lot of problems, I shouldn't think that that disqualifies me from doing things in ministry like hospitality and talking to people and encouraging other people. Uh, and so we, uh, we've often tried to convey that it, the gospel says that all of us are sinners, including those doing ministry, and that's a call to all of us to do ministry. Uh, Tim Geiger, uh, who was a pastor in this area for some time and uh, spent some time in City Reformed, um, I think was very influential in our church in this way. Uh, and he would argue that uh, many people uh, struggle very deeply with serious problems in their lives, <clears throat> and yet they feel they can't say that to anybody uh, in the church because you know, they feel like they're supposed to have it all together. Um, let me just tell you, in the leadership of this church, uh, many of us have spent time in counseling, including me. Uh, and so if you have problems, even serious problems, that doesn't disqualify you. Uh, that actually says that is part of who we are. We are sinners saved by grace. And everybody up here who you see uh, is somebody who is often at some point in their life uh, wrestled through something uh, really difficult. So now in practice, again, sort of application of this point, uh, is that what we, our goal is to see is many relationships in which people can confess their sins to one another, can confess their anxieties and their fears, uh, and that that can't possibly happen if the leaders are the only ones hearing confessions uh, and, and doing those one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, all of us have to be open and non-condemning and understanding the gospel, uh, both challenge one another to do what is good and also to hear those confessions of sin. And the gospel says, if we are forgiven in Christ, uh, then we have nothing to fear uh, about being condemned if we confess our sins to one another. And in fact, it's extremely healing in order to do that. And so I'd have to say, over the years, it really has been, uh, to a large degree, I've seen, I know a lot of stories of people who talk to other people one-on-one, -on -one, 
uh, and who really, uh, really were able to see growth in their life uh, because of that. Uh, and essentially, it has the mindset of saying, church is not an activity I do that could, sort of competes with my personal life, but the church is my people. These are my friends. These are my family. These are people who I want to be involved with. Uh, and we create that kind of community. And I think that's what we see in the passage uh, in front of us. And finally, um, uh, point number three. So if you're, uh, if you're taking notes, I'll give you a reminder here. Point number one was what I called a community of actually knowing each other. Uh, community two is everybody actually ministering. Uh, and the third point I'll call teaching with love. Uh, a common assumption, I have to say it's a common assumption in our type of church, Reformed churches. Uh, the common assumption is, well, you have to choose uh, in a church, you're either going to be like a really good doctrinal teaching church, uh, or you're going to be a really good fellowship loving church, but you can't be both. Uh, and so some people say, well, I really love this church because they're really good on doctrine, uh, but it's a really cold and impersonal church, but I just, you know, it's the best I can do. Uh, and other people say, well, yeah, this is a really good fellowship church. The teaching is super weak, but, uh, you know, I just love the community. Uh, and again, I would say the founding vision of City was to say we refuse to allow that to, to fall on one side or the other. Uh, that we are going to try to do good teaching uh, and to try to do good loving community. Uh, and notice in Acts 2 here, again, it's not uh, either or, right? It says that they were devoted to the teaching of the apostles and to the fellowship in the same breath. It doesn't say that they had to choose one or the other, it had part of the church that was devoted to the teaching, another part was devoted to the fellowship. Uh, but I would actually argue that the teaching makes the fellowship better. Uh, we read in the um, call to confession, uh, one of many places in the Bible where it says, uh, you, are, you don't know God if you are not someone who loves uh, the brothers and sisters. Uh, another way to put that, and some of you have heard me use this uh, line before, um, sometimes people say, well, so-and-so is really good at Bible doctrine, but in, in person, you know, he's not actually very loving. Uh, and to which I would respond, no, he's bad at doctrine then. Uh, because the doctrine of the Bible is that you should love. And if you don't get that, it's like saying, well, he's really good at physics, but he just can't do any equations. Um, you know, if, if the point of it is to do equations, like that's the, that's the starting point, you can't say you're good at it if you don't get point one. Uh, in the same way, if you say, well, this person's good at doctrine, but they're not very loving, and they say, no, they haven't, got, they haven't worked the first example of the book yet, because the first application of the doctrine is to be loving. Uh, but I want to flip that around also, uh, and challenge uh, people who might have the opposite tendency. Uh, there might be some people who say, well, so-and-so uh, is very uh, loving, but they're, you know, they're really bad at doctrine. Uh, they, you know, and I would argue that is like saying, um, that doctor is a very caring and loving medical doctor, but actually all the medicine he gives people make them sicker. Um, you know, if, if you love people well, you do things that actually make them healthier. Uh, you try to make them, try to be healing. Uh, and so the Bible doesn't allow a wedge between that in either direction. Uh, to love someone well often means to teach the truth of the Bible because God made us and he knows what he's talking about in the Bible uh, when he tells us that we need to hear certain things. Uh, and so uh, again, I would go back to the doctrine of the Bible uh, on the gospel is that uh, this should be incredibly freeing. Right? That when you understand the doctrine that you are now and forever forgiven and you are in a resting place with God, that should free your heart. Um, and you know, notice in this passage here uh, that we read, <coughs> uh, Peter is both very challenging and very gracious. Uh, he says, uh, you know, you standing here are guilty of the blood of Jesus. That's a pretty challenging, uh, convicting statement to make. And to such a degree that it says, they were cut to the heart. Uh, and yet he moves right on into grace and says, uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Uh, and the promise is for you uh, and for your children and all who are far off. Another way to put this is to say, 
Uh, suppose you're a Christian and you say, well, I know Jesus died for my sins, uh, but I have a terrible self-image problem. I worry all the time about what people think about me and I feel like I'm a failure. Okay, I would argue you fundamentally have a doctrinal problem. You fundamentally don't understand the teaching of the New Testament about the gospel. Because the gospel says uh, you are loved and free in Christ. And if you get that, that actually affects your self-image and affects how you relate to other people and affects your sense of success or failure. Uh, and so uh, you can't put a wedge between teaching uh, the scriptures and teaching the gospel uh, and the practice of love uh, and relationships uh, with each other. And this connects to the first two points because in fact, a lot of the teaching in this church is not just from up here, but it's in all these different relationships. Uh, whether it's in community group Bible studies or whether it's in one-on-one -on -one discipleship or just chatting with somebody after church, uh, we do a lot of interactive teaching uh, with each other and that's, I think, a good thing. So I'll just finish up with this, that uh, all of these three things I've talked about uh, are not unique to City Reformed. Uh, they, I would argue they should be the mindset of all kinds of churches that preach the gospel. Um, but I would say that these are things that we explicitly tried to build in uh, at the beginning. And I would challenge you, let's keep it going. Uh, let's keep it going. Let's keep the community real uh, and in some ways challenging to one another as we understand God's word. So let's close in prayer. Father, I uh, thank you uh, for these people, and I thank you for all the different people who've been at Reformed over the years. And Father, I thank you that um, your spirit uh, has been at work, that we have seen lives change, we've seen people challenged, and we've seen people grow. And Father, I pray your blessing on this church in the future, that um, we would be uh, what you call us to be in every aspect. And uh, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you turn your bulletin to uh, page 9, uh, we have a statement from one of the historical confessions of the church in the 1500s. Uh, I'll read the question and please respond to the part in whole. What are the special privileges of the visible church? The visible church has the privileges of being under God's special care and government, of being protected and preserved in all ages despite the opposition of all enemies, and of enjoying the communion of saints, the ordinary means of salvation, and the offers of grace by Christ to all the members of the visible church in the ministry of the gospel, testifying that whoever believes in him will be saved, and excluding none who are willing to come to him. Let's stand and sing.
Father, we do pray that blessing and honor and glory and strength would be attributed to you. You alone are eternal, infinite, unchanging in your very being. And yet you've invited us into your presence to be your people, to be transformed uh, increasingly into the image of Christ. So Lord, would you do this as we grow together uh, to be more like Jesus? In his name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. And please turn with me in your bulletin to pages 12 and 13. Uh, you know, each week uh, the information on, on page 13 is in your bulletin. We often don't point it out, but in light of a sermon that talked about the importance of community, our connections together, uh, page 13 is full of many of the important things we do together as a church. Um, and uh, if you uh, flip over to even 14, you'll notice uh, further groups that are there. Uh, not in the bulletin, but on our website are the list of the community groups that we have. These are important gatherings. Uh, you are welcome uh, and invited to join uh, each of our groups as they uh, continue to meet uh, growing in their fellowship and in their knowledge of the apostles' teaching through the Word of God. Um, uh, flip with me back to page 12 then. I'll just highlight some uh, important things that are coming up. Uh, three things you need to know about that relate to the end of the semester. Uh, next Sunday, uh, April 21st, we'll be acknowledging our graduates uh, from high school, college, or a graduate uh, program of different kinds. Uh, if you are graduating or know people who are and that information hasn't yet been shared with us, uh, please email us at office at cityreform.org, office at cityreform.org. We're gonna welcome you forward, acknowledge you, and celebrate with you as you move through this milestone. Two other things that, rep that are connected to the, the changing of the season and the end of, uh, ending of the, uh, near ending of the semester. Uh, we have a, uh, our, one of our sponsored ministries, our Reformed University Fellowship, RUF at Pitt, will be doing a graduate uh, banquet party uh, for their students, they need help. Uh, with food and other things, information's in the bulletin. Uh, that party will be this coming Saturday. So if you can help, uh, please either talk to Sarah or Callie about that. Third and finally related to the graduations, uh, we are finishing our, finishing our uh, semester of, of Sunday school. Next Sunday morning uh, on the 21st of April, our, during the Sunday school hour from 9 to 9.50ish, uh, we'll have a banquet in the room over there. It's our end of semester uh, breakfast. Our classes will be reporting. Uh, so we invite you to come, join us, have some food, and, and hear about what the various kids and, and classes have been learning. We'll hear some great reports and have a, a good meal together. There is a sign up in the bulletin. By doing that sign up, you can help us make sure we have enough food for everyone. So come, come and join us, but do please sign up. Two other things uh, to point out. Uh, this uh, next two weeks, we'll be in the gym. Uh, everything will be the same. Uh, probably those of you arriving won't notice that much difference in the schedule. Those of you working behind the scenes will know it takes a lot of work to get everything over there. Uh, but instead of uh, coming in, you'll come at the same time, do the same things, but you'll come in. If you park in the lot or walk through the lot, instead of making a left, to come here, you'll make a right to go there. It's just on the other side. Uh, and uh, we'll be doing um, uh, church 21st and the 28th there. So just something to have on your on your radar. Uh, and then finally, a reminder that in the, in the spirit of talking about parties, we are having a party uh, as a church, our 20th anniversary party. Uh, that's April 27th. The sign up deadline was last Monday. Wah, wah, wah. I didn't know what I was, <laughs> you know what I was thinking. But that was the bad news. Uh, the good news is if you had a change of plans or you just forgot, uh, we have a couple extra spots. Uh, you can email Catherine. This is the email, SST, staff support team, SST at cityreform.org. And we can, we can get you on a list and we can get you in. So uh, please come join us on the 27th. We're super excited. That's all I have. Is that a sad song? Oh, it's uh, Lean On Me. Daniel was offering support in the background. 
Uh, anyway, this has been a season, you know, it's a season of reflection. We're celebrating 20 years. I, I noticed today a, a lot of throwback songs. Is that right, Daniel? I made a playlist of all the songs we sang in the very first uh, worship service. Okay. And maybe we'll include that uh, in the next uh, altar team at all. Okay. Listen to the songs that we sang in our very first church. Service. Yeah, Daniel's been going down memory lane uh, with his music, so we'll, we'll get that for you. So um, uh, that's all I have. I'll send you with a blessing. Let me, let me send you with a blessing and invite you to come join us for a bagel afterwards. May the love of God and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Go in peace.